did a video on motors and ESCs, but to be honest, it's the one video I'd like to not necessarily redo, but revise and add to what was already there. That and my mic quality back then wasn't great. So in this video, I'm going to go over every electronic part in an electric RC car, specifically what you'd find in a standard 10th scale racing rig, though this will still apply to bashers and other electric racing rigs on different scales for the most part. This will probably be my longest video in a while, so be sure to sit back and relax. Before we begin, however, I'd like to remind you to subscribe to the channel as we're getting really close to a thousand subs and that's genuinely amazing. Without further delay, this is a crash course on RC Electronics. Let's start with something that I haven't talked about before and that's the steering servo. The steering servo does exactly what it says on the tin. It steers the car. There are many different types of servos out there, all with different sizes and specifications, but for now we're just going to focus on the standard size for 10th scale and 8th scale cars as they are the most common. It's important to know, however, that there are two different types of size for these standard size servos, however. Your standard size and your low profile servos. These low profile servos pretty much have the same length as the standard servo, but are much lower in height. These servos are generally used in touring cars and sometimes in two-wheel drive buggies. The next thing I want to go over in servos is the torque. The torque of the servo is basically how much force the servo can inflict on an object. Take for example this servo in my tool drive buggy. This Savox 1258TG is rated at 133 ounce inches of torque on a regular battery and 166.6 ounce inches of torque on a high voltage battery. Little side note, make sure your servo is rated to run a high voltage battery first as you can burn it up if it's not. Generally, the larger the RC car is, the more torque your servo will need to be able to move the front wheels. 8th scale cars specifically need high torque servos to perform optimally. On smaller 10th scale cars like 4-wheel drive buggies, stadium trucks, and short course trucks, you can usually get away with a servo that's a little bit less in torque, and on a 2-wheel drive buggy, generally torque isn't that important. What's more important on 2-wheel drive buggies and 10th scale rigs as a whole is the speed of the servo. The speed rating on a servo is rated via how long it takes the servo itself unladen to turn 60 degrees. That means no servo horn. Again, using my 1258TG as an example, it's rated at 0.1 seconds to turn 60 degrees on a regular battery and 0.08 seconds to turn 60 degrees on a high voltage battery. Like I mentioned before, you're generally going to want a higher speed servo for smaller vehicles like 10 scale off-road cars and especially on-road cars. Since lots of servos from the same manufacturers look exactly the same, they will usually try to make it easier for you by marking the servos as high torque, high speed, and low profile. This makes it easier to choose what servo you need for your application. I will also say it's important to grab a servo with metal gears if possible as that reduces the chance of stripping them. The last thing you really need to know about servos before you go in and buy one is the difference between brushed, coreless, and brushless servos. From the former to the latter, they go from least expensive to most expensive for the most part. Coreless servos generally have higher speeds than brushless servos, but brushless servos generally have the most torque to them, so apply your wallet accordingly. Next up we have the battery itself. This is what powers everything in your car, so let's go over what all of these numbers and letters mean on this specific battery. Aridi Power Zappers SG4 High Voltage LiPo. That's a mouthful. First we have the milliamp hours. This number basically shows the capacity of the battery. The larger the number, the longer the battery can go without a charge. This particular battery has a capacity of 4100 milliamp hours. One thing to know is that the larger the milliamp hour rating, generally the heavier and larger the battery will be, whereas lower profile batteries tend to have much lower capacities. Next up we have the C rating. The C rating is basically how much power the battery can discharge without degrading or blowing up. Usually batteries have two C ratings, one for constant use and the other for 10 second bursts. Generally, batteries with higher burst C ratings are used for things like drag racing, whereas racing rigs rely on the constant C rating. This also extends to what exactly is labeled on the battery itself. Usually, batteries will have the burst C rating labeled on them, and racing batteries like this will have a constant C rating labeled. What does this all mean for driving? 
Well, generally, batteries with a higher C rating will have more punch than those with a lower C rating. It's part of the reason why racing and drag batteries have such a high C rating, because they need to have that extra punch without blowing up. Lastly, you have the voltage slash cell count. Each cell in a LiPo battery has a certain voltage and when they are wired together in series, they add to each other. For example, each cell in this 7.6 volt high voltage battery is rated at 3.8 volts individually. Add them together in series and you get 7.6 volts. In a regular two cell pack, they are rated at 3.7 volts per cell, adding up to 7.4 volts. Volts are directly linked to how fast the motor spins, so the more volts you have, the faster the motor will spin. However, when it comes to racing, the amount of cells you're allowed to run is usually limited. Two cells for 10th scale racing and four cells for 8th scale racing. Last thing I want to go over about batteries is the difference between normal LiPos and high voltage LiPos. When a battery is fully charged, it has more punch than say when it is in the middle of its charge. A high voltage battery allows you to hold on to that punch for longer as it starts to fall off. The last thing you need to worry about when it comes to your battery is if your battery terminals are 4mm or 5mm so you don't connect up the wrong terminal plugs to your ESC. Usually the most expensive part of your RC, the ESC is what controls the motor's power, its braking, and powers the receiver. Your ESC, much like your transmitter, has many different settings on it that unlike your transmitter, you might actually use. Things like drag brake, neutral range, punch level, and other such settings are there to make driving your RC car a little bit easier. Now in stock racing, the ESC is put into blinking mode, which means no boost timing or turbo timing. It is legal in mod class though, so keep that in mind. There are many different types of ESCs out there, all different amp ratings and brands with all different names for the same settings. To keep it simple, let's just go over the amp rating. The amp rating on an ESC basically denotes how powerful a motor the ESC can actually handle. For example, this Hobbywing V3 on 60 amp, I believe, can handle anything down to 3.2 turns, or 3.5 turns, I'm sorry, on two cell batteries. Make sure you consult your ESC manual to make sure it's what the ESC is compatible with. The motor is the second most expensive thing in your RC car usually. It's also the simplest, yet most complicated part. For now though, we're just going to focus on 10th scale. Generally, 10th scale motors, unless you're talking about four-wheel drive short course trucks, are rated in turns and not KV rating. All you really need to know about the turn rating of your motor is, the lower the turn rating, the more powerful the motor will be, both in torque and in top speed. That's why drag cars usually use very low turn motors like 3.5 to even 2.5 turns. In stock racing, everyone uses the same turn motor. In tool drive buggy, for example, people either use 21.5 or 17.5 turn motors, and in four-wheel drive, they either use 13.5 or even 10.5 turn motors. In stock racing, you also have the ability to adjust the mechanical timing of the motor, as in the timing setting on the motor itself. The higher the timing is, the faster the motor will spin. Now, why wouldn't you want to run max timing all the time? Well, if you run too much timing, you'll lose torque and efficiency, causing the motor to overheat. Balancing how much timing you want on the motor to maximize high-end speed and low-end grunt is all part of the setup game when it comes to RC racing. Generally, you're going to want to tune your timing and gearing specific to your track. For example, on a larger, more open track, you might need more top-end speed, whereas a smaller, more technical track might require more low-end torque. I mentioned in my stock racing upgrade video about the temperature you should be going for, and that should be right around 140 to 150 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm going to rapid fire through a few of the simpler parts of an RC car, so let's go over them quickly. The receiver is what connects your car to your transmitter. It also receives power from the ESC and diverts that power to the other parts of the car like the servo or any other accessories. For future reference, you plug the servo into channel 1 and the ESC into channel 2. The transponder is what allows the track hardware to register your laps. They are also stupid expensive. A gyro is almost never used in racing as they are considered a driver aid and thus not allowed. Only place you'll see them is drifting cars. And lastly, we have a fan. It's a fan. And that's all the electronics you'll see in an RC racing rig. If you made it this far, I really appreciate you. If you liked the video and learned something from it, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe if you want to see more. As of the time of me writing this, we're only 30 subscribers away from 1,000, and I couldn't be more thankful. Speaking of which, I'd like to thank my patrons Michael Williams, Lucas Tarka, RC World Discord server, Casey Nix, and Ben Reeves. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.